Howdy y'all, welcome back to Geography 110. I hope you've had a great weekend. I just wanted to fill you in a little bit on what's coming up. So for the last week and a half or so, we've been talking a lot about geology. Well, we're not gonna be leaving geology behind entirely, but instead we're gonna be focusing a little bit more on weathering and how geologic surfaces begin to break down over time. Now, I want to make sure that you're aware this is a little bit different than geomorphology. We're going to be engaging with geomorphology in the subsequent units, um, dealing with fluvial geomorphology, how rivers change landscapes. No, what we're going to be looking at instead is more how gravity, specifically gravity and time and chemical processes, begin to break down rocks and geologic landscapes. So. Let's go ahead and get started. So as I mentioned in the opening bit, we are moving a little bit away from geology, um, although we're still going to sort of keep a hand on geology, if you will. And we're gonna be focusing a little bit more on weathering and the ways that uh, geologic uh, formations begin to break down over time and what causes that. Before we do, I'd kind of like to engage a little bit with uh, some of the things that y'all been putting on the forum uh, in regards to the weekly recap. Today is uh, Saturday, and so I know that quite a few of you still haven't posted your responses, um, but I can clearly see two themes showing up uh, where y'all are having a little bit of trouble. The first of which is plate tectonics, and the other one is uh, human-induced earthquakes as related to hydraulic fracturing. So let's start with plate tectonics. So as I showed you in that map uh, several times during that particular lecture, uh, lecture, the entire earth is sort of divided into a bunch of different tectonic plates which um, sit basically and float on top of the asthenosphere, right? So you have those plates, they're, they're pretty solid, and then they're floating on sort of a, a liquid or at least kind of molten rock asthenosphere. There are three different ways that plates can interact with one another. The first of which is when plates come together and then you have uh, this convergent boundary. And we talked a little bit about this uh, in the early part of last week as well as during uh, our lecture on volcanoes. As that plate subducts underneath, uh, in this case it would probably be the continental plate, it would cause volcanoes. The second main type of plate boundary is divergent boundaries. And so whenever two plates are separating, uh, you're going to create sort of a, a thin spot in the Earth's crust, which would allow for uh, volcanic activity to occur there as well. Um, that, and we can see an example of a divergent boundary in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, as well as in the Great Rift Valley in Africa. The third main type of plate interaction is going to be whenever two plates slide past one another. And this is what we see in the San Andreas Fault. Now, as they slide past one another, um, it's unlikely that the, this type of interaction would lead to a volcano, for example. But as you can imagine, as they slide past one another, they're going to create a lot of friction. And so as that as you have that friction, the, the rock, the pressure builds up, builds up, builds up, and then it releases. And when it releases, that's what causes an earthquake. And so we can say, and of course earthquakes are you know, possible with all of these types of plate boundaries, but you see the largest earthquakes sometimes associated with this transform boundary. So uh, again, these are the three different types of plate interactions, convergent boundary, divergent boundary, and transform boundary. Now, related to uh, human induced earthquakes and hydraulic fracturing, a lot of you have had questions on that. And so what I talked about on, um, I guess it was uh, Wednesday, was discussing the fact that saltwater disposal wells, and by saltwater, I basically, I don't mean like oceanic water. I, I should, probably should have clarified that. By saltwater, I mean just water that comes out from deep in the uh, Earth's uh, uh, geology deep underground. Um, uh, petroleum geologists refer to that as saltwater because it has a bunch of dissolved solids in it. And so 
earthquakes are most commonly associated with saltwater disposal wells. And just to uh, give you a little bit more background on that, hydraulic fracturing uh, is uh, a cause is basically what you do whenever you hydraulic fracture is you inject a lot of water. Like I said, you know, around 5 million gallons of water, a little bit of sand, a little bit of gel, deep into underground formations. And these shale plays are, uh, I would say, probably on average between five and 10,000 feet underground. So they're going to be pretty deep. And then they use a, a little bit of explosives, a little bit of water, and it injects into the formation. That process by itself does not create large earthquakes. Um, that process is merely for pumping water into the underground. And that water, what it does is it cracks apart the geology and allows for sand because it's carrying some sand and this and basically that sand gets carried into those little cracks into that shale and as the water retreats the sand stays where it is and it keeps those cracks open so that the oil and gas that's in that shale play can come back and come to the surface now how does hydraulic fracturing cause earthquakes well it's indirect so what happens is that you get a lot of water from that fracking process, right? All the water you pump down in the ground, most of it's going to come back up. So you're left with like 4 million gallons of really dirty, um, ugly, chemically contaminated water. Uh, odds are you're not going to recycle it, although there is some effort to, to push for that. Instead, you're going to dispose of it. And you're not only disposing of that water, but the, the formation that you're drilling into also has a lot of water just indigenous in there, living in there, basically. I mean, not living in the biological context, but just like indigenous to that location in the, in the subsurface geology, there's going to be a lot of water. So as you're collecting the oil and gas uh, from that shale, you're also collecting lots and lots of water. And like I said in class on Wednesday, um, for every barrel of oil that you produce, you produce on average about five barrels of water. And so that water also needs to be disposed of because, again, it has a lot of chemicals in it, it has a lot of oil and gas, and it, it uh, frankly, it's kind of hard to recycle too. So you dispose of both the uh, fracking water um, that returns to the surface as well as the uh, produced water that comes from the shale play into a saltwater disposal well. And those saltwater disposal wells, those wells go about 15 to 20,000 feet underground. And they're meant to pump the water into a place where it becomes inaccessible because that water is so dirty. But it turns out when you drill that deep and when you start pumping millions and millions and millions of gallons of water, it tends to lubricate um, you know, small fault lines. In which case, when those faults give way, that's what causes, uh, that's what causes the, the little earthquakes to occur. And like I say, on average, uh, the earthquakes are going to be so small, you won't even feel them. Um, it's only occasionally where they become a little bit more dangerous. Okay, so as I said earlier, uh, the concepts and ideas that we learned in geology, and frankly, even going all the way back to biogeography, are still going to be relevant here as we begin to talk about weathering. Um, and so I just want to make sure that you keep those ideas that we've had in mind for the last two or three weeks, keep them there, keep them in the front of your mind as we begin to talk about all these different sorts of processes. So what is weathering? Weathering is simply the breakdown of rocks and soils and minerals uh, through contact with the atmosphere, water, and even biological organisms, as we're going to see in a little bit. There are two primary types of weathering. You're going to encounter chemical weathering as well as physical weathering. Um, and the idea with weathering is that you have uh, sort of like uh, before you have you have this sort of equilibrium going on for a long, long time, and then something happens. There's what we refer to as a geomorphic threshold where, boom, it throws the whole system out of whack, and then it operates at a new uh, equilibrium for the future. 
And so this is referred to as dynamic equilibrium, which means that you operate at a single equilibrium for a little while, and then you may operate at a different equilibrium for a longer period of time. You can think of this in the context of an avalanche, for example, right? Prior to the avalanche, the mountain may look one particular way for a very long while, then boom, you have a geomorphic threshold event that occurs. And then presto, you have a, a new sort of normal that takes place for, uh, for another period of time until you have a, another avalanche or another uh, event that occurs that causes this dynamic or causes this equilibrium to change once again. So one of those things that's super critical to know about weathering is going to be the slope, right? Because the slope is going to dictate um, the, the speed of the weathering, its uh, response to gravity, for example. And so a slope is, of course, as you're probably already aware, is just a, a curved or inclined surface um, that may form the boundary between two different landforms. Uh, and so, uh, and we can think of slopes as existing in the, at the equilibrium point between shear stress and shear strength. And what do I mean by that? Well, shear stress as being uh, that, uh, that force that is pushing down on a, a particular location, pushing down, um, trying to cause a, a particular slope to break apart. And then you have shear strength, which is uh, the, either the friction or the materials or the way that the slope is able to maintain its composure. And so a slope is in equilibrium between the shear stress, i.e. the stuff that wants to go down, and the shear strength, i.e. the forces that want to keep uh, everything in balance. So we can also uh, think about this in the, in the context of the angle of repose. And the angle of repose is uh, like the, the maximum level of steepness that you can have in a particular slope. And uh, that is really dependent upon the, the size, the texture, um, the consistency, um, the, even the temperature to some extent of all the materials that are, are present on that slope. So angle of repose, maximum slope before the slope begins to, begins to degrade and you have an event that takes place, whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's a rock slide or whether it's some sort of other weathering event that's going to occur. There are two different types of slopes that I want you to be aware of. There's uh, waxing slopes. And so that is as you descend down the slope, the angle becomes steeper, 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 steeper. And so here's a, a photo I took uh, from Hawaii. And you can see in this, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty kind of flat on top. Then the slope becomes a little bit steeper. Then the slope becomes steeper, steeper, steeper. And then it, it becomes basically a cliff. This is referred to as a waxing slope. A waning slope, on the other hand, is a slope that becomes more shallow the further uh, you descend down into it. So in this example I have here from uh, Alaska, you can see that it's, it's a little bit steeper towards the top, but as you descend down, it becomes gentler, gentler, gentler until it, in fact it becomes rather flat. The next couple topics that I'm going to cover in lecture examine some processes that you may already be aware of, and that is bedrock and the weathering that occurs around bedrock. Instead of showing you slides though, I figured it'd be easier if I just took you outside here at the ranch and showed you what this looks like in nature. So uh, here we go. So here we are, we're on the edge of a cliff, right down there is a dry stream bed. Um, this is here out at the ranch, just outside of Fort Worth. And one of those things I kind of wanted to show you is if I look down here, you can see that there's a, a fair amount of soil, so it'll fall off the side of the mountain. See, we got a lot of soil right here, and the soil is actually pretty good, right? It's got a, a lot of leaves, it's got some black dirt, it's looking pretty nice, right? All right, good soil here. Now, if I, I walk a few, a few foot or two, let me get out of the way, make sure I don't fall off the cliff. We can look here and we can say, whoa, here is a big slab of rock. Now, if I look back, we can see this rock disappears under the soil, but it appears to be, you know, probably about uh, five 
maybe six feet below the, the soil there at the top of the mountain, upon which you can sort of see way off in the distance, that's where the house is. So here we are, we have this big rock. This is referred to as bedrock, and this particular bedrock is sedimentary rock, you can see because it has all these pieces of shell in it and um, lots of old organic material from long ago. And on top of this uh, bedrock, we have some other sort of sedimentary rocks that clearly came from the bedrock. Here's some examples here. You know, we can see we got some kind of unconsolidated shells, um, some other rocks, right? All this, which is kind of loose rock through here. Oops, we just threw that off the side of the cliff. That's what your uh, book refers to as regolith. So this stuff on top, this is regolith. And over time, provided this slab of rock doesn't fall off into the creek, over time, this regolith down here is going to actually degrade down and become soils. And in fact, I can accelerate this process by just like crushing this rock right here. And it turns into um, some a fine powder that will eventually become part of the soils. Now, your book also refers to uh, things such as outcrops. This piece of rock that I'm standing on right here, this is an outcrop. This is a, a piece of uh, bedrock that is exposed from the soil. If I walk up the, the mountain just a little bit here, I can show you a, another kind of smaller outcrop. Right here, again, this is a, let's see if I can get the focus to work. Over here is, a, is another outcrop here. This is a, a smaller piece of bedrock. So in this particular setup that we have here, we have a bunch of soil. Then we have kind of a, a small group of bedrock right here, then another bit of soil, and then we have this much larger bedrock over here. This is sort of the main bedrock for the soil on which I'm standing. So now that you've seen what this looks like in nature, why don't we take a look at this uh, from a three-dimensional perspective. So if we have here, we're going to call this just like the, the top of the land or the top of the soil. And then up here, you know, we have uh, my house that you just saw way off in the distance. You can see I'm not a very good artist. Now, below the house, if you go down eh, maybe about four feet, right, you're all through here, you're going to encounter soil. And this is, uh, you know, what you're probably going to see right underneath your house, too, is you're going to see a fair amount of soil. Now, as we saw there just outside, there's a layer of bedrock. It's a small layer. It's not quite as thick as that big one that I showed you a minute ago. But you have a small layer of bedrock. And as someone who has drilled many a fence post out at my ranch, I can tell you for a fact that that rock, that small, thin piece of rock that you saw outside, that rock exists all over that region. And every time I've tried to build a fence right near the house, I always encounter that small bit of rock. And then you break through, right? And for the next three or so feet, you encounter soil, right? And that was that bit of soil that I was walking on. Now below the, the three feet of soil, that's when you encounter that much thicker piece of bedrock. But you have all the soil right here. Okay, so that helps explain some of the of what you saw out there, but what about those little pieces of rock that were sitting on top of the bedrock? What I refer to as the regolith, right? And so here I'm just going to draw that. Those little pieces of rock, those are called regolith. And you saw that on the, the places where the bedrock was exposed, uh, what's referred to as an outcropping. On top of that outcropping, we had a little bit of regolith. In the soils and, and deep underground, you would also encounter this regolith. And that just comes from the, the natural erosion of the bedrock over time uh, due to water, due to sifting uh, soils uh, on top of the, the bedrock. And so we can know for a fact that we're going to encounter a little bit of regolith there, as well as a little bit of regolith right here.
All right, now that we've taken a quick look at bedrock, let's look at some of the ways that um, that bedrock can be eroded away over time. And so we're going to be taking a look at six different metrics that affect the speed of weathering. The first of which is going to be rock composition. A soft rock may weather away much more quickly than a hard rock. So we can think of a sandstone washing away over time. That's going to happen a little bit more quickly than, say, if you had a piece of granite and you were trying to, to weather that over time. Again, the mineral composition, very similar uh, to the same, uh, very similar to the soft versus hard idea, right? Uh, sandstone, which is made mostly of sand and sort of sedimentary rock, right? That's going to erode uh, much more quickly than, say, um, a metamorphic rock that has been created as a result of temperature and pressure. The number of joints within a rock is also going to determine the speed of weathering. You can see here, this is a photo that I took when I was traveling around Costa Rica a couple of years back. And this particular rock has a lot of grooves in it. If those grooves were to become deeper and be able to hold on to water, then that would generally refer to as a joint, um, especially if that uh, joint actually cuts all the way through the rock. So what is a joint? Well, a joint is a location where water is able to, to seep into the rock because there's a, either a crack or some sort of indentation in the surface. And as that water seeps in, it's able to kind of weather away that rock. And we're going to focus a little bit more on that in just a second when we discuss freeze-thaw action. So rock composition, that's the first thing. The second thing, or the second metric, basically, that can um, uh, impact the, the speed of weathering is going to be climate. So if you're in a colder climate, you're going to encounter a lot more of the freeze-thaw action. What do I mean by that? Well, just as before, as I was talking about those joints, what happens if that water gets in the joint, stays in the joint, and then overnight it freezes. Or if you're in an Arctic location and it freezes for uh, several weeks or stays frozen for weeks or months on end, well, what happens is that as that water solidifies into an ice, it expands slightly, which causes that rock to break apart over time. We can see here in this photo I took from Alaska near a glacier that this particular rock has a big joint running through the middle. Now, over the course of the next several years, as water gets in, freezes, expands, and then exits whenever uh, you get above freezing, you can imagine that if that occurs for several more years, it's likely that rock is just going to split in two. That is essentially the idea that you're uh, supposed to think about in terms of freeze-thaw action in relation to weathering, right? As a, as a surface over time, it may have a, a little bit of freeze-thaw action with the, with the, as that surface you know, experiences that ice, it's going to expand out. And then whenever the ice uh, melts, turns back into water, that uh, that action is going to, to basically uh, leave open the gap, if you will, that freeze thaw action. And when that occurs over the course, you know, obviously it's gonna happen several times during a single year, but it, of course, if you multiply that over the course of several years or decades or millennia, that has a tremendous impact on the landscape. So in colder climates, we have the freeze thaw action. In warmer climates, we have uh, chemical weathering. We're going to be talking a little bit more about chemical weathering and what uh, causes chemical weathering here in a little bit, but we can see a situation here. Uh, this is my friends and I were walking around Costa Rica, and up here along the top part of the cinder block wall, you can see that the, the cinder blocks have actually discolored. There's not that much pollution in Costa Rica. There's not enough there to cause that discoloration of the wall. It's in fact due to chemical weathering, i.e. The, the chemical composition of the upper part of this wall is actually beginning to change slightly. So, so far we've looked at rock composition and, and climate. The next metric uh, that can impact weathering is gonna be slope orientation. 
And so if you have a slope that is exposed to the sun and the wind and the precipitation, if you're in the northern hemisphere and you're sitting on a, a southern slope, for example, um, odds are that southern slope is going to have a very different sort of weathered profile as compared to the northern slope. And so a southern slope um, would be exposed to perhaps a lot more sun. Um, depending on the prevailing winds, uh, a particular slope might be impacted. Another thing to keep in mind is that uh, slope is also important for vegetation. And as we're going to discuss here in a minute, vegetation is an important driver of weathering. And so uh, you may have always heard the axiom that moss grows on the north side of trees. Uh, it's also true for rocks too. And so if you have a bunch of moss on a rock, the, the presence of that moss is going to initiate as well as accelerate the process of weathering over time. The next metric that we're going to be taking a look at is subsurface water, right? The relative location of the water table is important in determining how much weathering is going to take place. If the, if the water table is really close to the surface, then it doesn't take much for there to be flooding on the surface, for example. Or if the water table um, sits really deep underground, that means that whenever precipitation hits the surface, it's, it's going to be sucked right in and go deep underground, down into the aquifer, down to where the water table is. We're gonna be talking a little bit more about this in just a minute whenever we get to karst formations, but um, we'll just say for right now that subsurface water is an important driver of weathering, especially for karst uh, landscapes. One that we've already talked about is going to be vegetation. Uh, this metric, of course, illustrates the ways that uh, vegetation can protect rocks. You know, um, if you have a tree that grows around a rock, odds are that rock is going to be in a pretty secure spot or location for a while. It, it can also stabilize soil. This is a photo from the creek bed that's behind the house where I'm currently living at. And you can see that this tree um, is sort of hanging on by, by a thread here, but uh, its roots extend deep into the soil and is stabilizing this ledge that would otherwise just collapse down into the creek. Uh, vegetation can also cause chemical weathering. So whenever you have uh, moss or um, algae that sort of builds up on a rock, um, that's uh, introducing new chemicals to that uh, rock formation. And so therefore, vegetation can also be an important driver of breaking apart rocks. So vegetation can both uh, resist weathering for certain landscapes as well as accelerate weathering for certain landscapes. And what do I mean by that? Well, let me give you an example, right? You walk around campus at UNC, and as you're walking around, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but I, I get distracted really easily. And so I'm walking around and I, and I don't look where I'm walking. And uh, I can't tell you how many times I've tripped on bricks that are um, kind of raised up above the other bricks uh, on the pathways. And that's often because there's a tree nearby and the roots from that tree are pushing up and causing that brick um, to either elevate slightly or I've seen several instances in where the tree uh, roots actually go in and begin to break apart that brick. Um, and so uh, that's what I mean by vegetation as being an important driver of weathering. The most important driver of weathering is frankly just going to be time. And so the longer that a process is exposed to a rock or to a surface, the longer that surface is exposed to chemical and physical weathering, the, the processes that are going to begin to weather it down. And so if you have, um, uh, say for example, uh, you, you have a rock, and it's just only slightly affected by freeze-thaw action. Well, freeze-thaw action for one year may not cause a noticeable difference in that rock. But if you look at freeze-thaw action on that rock over the course of uh, decades, centuries, or perhaps even millennia, odds are there's going to be some change on that rock during that time due to freeze-thaw. And that's just because uh, time, the repetition of processes, the, the application of a particular weathering process to a rock over a longer period of time is just going to induce more weathering. 
another sort of physical process. So we've, we've talked about the six different metrics that, that cause weathering. Um, these are some other metrics that can cause weathering, although it's not particularly frequent. Um, so this particularly, or this particular uh, weathering process involves salt. And so if we have weathering via salt crystallization, this is referred to as haloclasty, right? H-A-L-O-C-L-A-S-T-Y, haloclasty. And so what happens is that you have a, a rock formation and it's a bedrock if you, if you kind of want to see in this particular example, we have some bedrock that's spread out here and a saline solution permeates down into the rock's cracks. Well, normally that wouldn't be a problem, but as the water evaporates, it's going to leave that salt behind. And when it's really hot outside, those salt crystals are going to heat up and expand a lot more than the rock, uh, than the rock itself, right? And so whenever those salt crystals expand, it's going to break apart that rock and cause that stone to fragment. This is a rather common uh, weathering process that we see both in arid locations, so you can think of uh, particular deserts, as well as in coastal climates. And it almost always, not 100% not of the time, but almost always gives rise to this really cool kind of honeycomb uh, weathered look that you see here in the photograph. You can see that the, the joints here between the rocks or the, the little cracks between the rocks are just filled with salt. Um, and it gives that, that really kind of fascinating look to it. There are other physical weathering processes that um, the last one we're going to be taking a look at is going to be exfoliation. And exfoliation is uh, just whenever the, the outer shell of a particular piece of rock begins to, to kind of break apart and then just, you know, frankly, fall off the side or slough off the edge of the rock. The actual, and you can see it right here, this is a little piece of granite, right? You can see that in times past, um, this granite may have extended out, um, a, a, you know, another couple feet or so than it currently is. But uh, every once in a while, a piece of rock is just going to slough off and fall off the side. It creates a rather smooth surface along the edge of the rock. And then, of course, all the debris gets uh, collects down at the bottom. The actual process of exfoliation has been very well documented across the world, but honestly, it's not very well understood what causes this process. Um, and for any of you aspiring hydrologists or more specifically uh, geologists who are interested in weathering, um, that is definitely an area of research that you could take up. The leading theory uh, is that the outer layers of a big slab of rock will heat up and therefore begin to expand a little bit more than the inner layers. And so you have the, the outer layers, they're getting hot. They, they may at some point actually become um, uh, so hot as compared that basically that temperature gradient becomes so strong that the, the cracks appear between the outer layers of the rock and the inner layers of the rock. And so once you have those cracks, then, um, then, then gravity, as well as some of the other sort of weathering processes that we've looked at, such as freeze-thaw, um, or uh, as we're about to talk about here in a minute, chemical weathering. Basically, once those cracks appear, um, then the, the outer shell of that rock will begin to slough off and fall off to the side. Uh, but again, that's just a theory. Uh, there is still a considerable amount of uncertainty surrounding how this process takes place. So we've looked at physical weathering and I've sort of talked a little bit about chemical weathering or at least I've talked around it. Let's go ahead and delve a little bit deeper into chemical weathering. So with physical weathering, we're talking about physical processes, be the uh, freeze-thaw action or uh, uh, the process of time on a particular location or even the, you know, the creation of salt crystals and how that can uh, spread apart rocks. Chemical weathering, on the other hand, is, is the way that a, a particular piece of rock or a particular piece of bedrock or a landscape just breaks down over time due to a chemical reaction. 
And so uh, something to keep in mind about chemical weathering is that this is sort of a differential process, right? Whereas physical weathering, um, of course, depends on rock materials. Uh, a soft rock may uh, rode away a little bit quicker than um, a hard rock. Uh, in chemical weathering, there's going to be some pieces of a rock that may react to certain compounds, whereas other pieces of a rock may not. So if you're walking around the Grand Canyon and say, for example, you look up and you see one strata that sticks out way far out. Well, that particular strata is going to be, is uh, theoretically resistant uh, compared to its other strata. It's resistant to both physical and chemical weathering. Whereas the other strata that may be uh, a little bit more coplanar with the, with the edge of the cliff or may even have a little bit of an indentation into the side of the cliff at the Grand Canyon, those uh, strata of rocks, those strata may be a little bit more susceptible to chemical and physical weathering. So just be aware that differential weathering um, means that some aspect of a rock or bedrock may weather at a different speed as compared to other rocks. And that is because of um, both the, the chemical material of that rock as well as the, the sort of chemical reactions that are taking place within that rock. So what are some of the reactions that we might uh, encounter that are, are pretty common? One of which is gonna be hydration, and it's really not precisely a chemical reaction. What it is is just that water gets into that geologic material and sort of combines up with it. And so instead of having just a, a completely dry piece of rock, you may have a rock that has um, that is hydrophilic, meaning that it really likes water. And so it soaks up that water and the water gets deep into uh, the rock. Uh, we see this uh, quite a bit with sandstone, for example. Hydrolysis, on the other hand, is the decomposition of a chemical compound that reacts with water. And we see this uh, pretty frequently with silicates. And so uh, if you have a silicate and you introduce some water to it, over time, it's, it's probably going to begin to, um, uh, begin to, to weather away. Another sort of weathering process that you're probably pretty familiar with is going to be oxidation. And we think of this especially with iron containing compounds, but it's basically a chemical weathering of a metallic element that combines with oxygen. So we go from iron to iron oxide, for example. You've seen this uh, quite a bit and, and say you, you drive around and you see a steel building and you see that, that rust that appears, that's oxidation. Or if you have an old steel car and uh, the paint has washed away or has uh, gone away and, and now the, that steel is exposed to uh, water as well as all the other sort of elements of the environment, that's oxidation, right? Seeing, going from that steel kind of gray color to an orange color, um, that is oxidation. And, and it occurs not only with your car, but it occurs just naturally in environment as well. This is a, a rock that has a fair amount of iron in it. And you can see that um, oxygen has reacted with this rock and is beginning to, to oxidize it and turn it into that bright, red-orange color that indicates oxidation. Carbonation, on the other hand, is whenever a chemical compound reacts with carbon dioxide. And we see this most frequently with limestone and, and marble. Um, and where do you see limestone and marble oftentimes? Well, in graveyards, for example. And so what happens is that limestone reacts with the carbon dioxide creating carbonic acid, which just then begins to erode away the stone. And so we have, uh, this is a, a photo I took from downtown Manhattan in New York City. And you can see this is an old graveyard. And a lot of these tombstones have lost uh, a little bit of their form and structure. And it's frankly kind of hard to read those tombstones because the lettering is, isn't quite as visible. This is carbonation taking place. This is that limestone as it begins to weather away due to its chemical reaction with CO2. Okay, so up until this point, we've examined uh, two different types of weathering, chemical weathering and physical weathering. It turns out that when you have a lot of limestone and that carbonation is kind of put into effect and that carbonation sort of links up with physical weathering, 
in a location where you have a lot of limestone, then you have what's referred to as a karst landscape. And so uh, karst landscapes are important not only because they make up about 15% of the world's land area, but also because they create very unique landforms, uh, one of which that you're probably very familiar with is going to be a cave. And we're going to talk more about caves here in just a second. Karst landscapes uh, have to be made of limestone, and that limestone has to contain about 80% uh, calcium carbonate. So it's, it's a very calcium carbonate rich limestone. What else do you need to have a karst landscape? Well, you also need a complex pattern of joints in that landscape. Um, you need a water table that's relatively close to the surface. And you need a lot of vegetation cover. So if you just have a, a karst landscape um, without vegetation cover in, say, an arid location, it's pretty unlikely that you're going to get a lot of the karst landforms um, that you're about to be introduced here in just a second. Just a, a brief kind of note that I think is pretty cool. My ranch that I uh, co-own with my family northwest of Austin um, sits uh, in an area where there's a lot of karst activity. And so if you go deep enough underground, you would actually encounter a, a karst landscape. But uh, up on the surface, you can see outcroppings every once in a while. And this is a, a rock that I encountered when I was down at the ranch uh, uh, two weeks ago. And you can see it has these kind of deep indentations. It's a little piece of limestone that um, easily cracks apart. And you get these things that sort of look like sinkholes into the rock. This is what's going on on a much larger scale in an actual karst landscape that's visible from the surface. Um, and so here we can see an example of it, right? You have the limestone layers you have, um, and those limestone layers have big kind of cavernous uh, interiors in some locations. Um, some of those things where, you know, when those caverns actually reach the surface, that's when you begin to see sinkholes. And so uh, if you have a river that comes along and it encounters one of these sinkholes, um, that's what's referred to as a disappearing stream. And uh, one of the, the most common <clears throat> karst, or one of the, the most notable karst landscapes in the United States is actually found in central Texas. Um, and we have quite a few uh, disappearing streams where the, the stream will go along, go along, go along, and then it'll encounter a sinkhole. And it'll just disappear into the earth um, where uh, that stream will actually then enter into an aquifer. Uh, the aquifer that it enters into in central Texas is the Edwards Aquifer. You don't need to know that, but I think that that's really cool. And so you have these sinkholes uh, where streams will go in and sort of disappear. Uh, the next sort of topic that I'd like you to be aware of is a, is a cenote. And that keyword, that word refers to a sinkhole that has become so deep that you can actually begin to interact with the groundwater. Uh, so basically you can think of instead of these being uh, dry kind of uh, cavernous locations underground, you can think of them as being filled with water in the event of having an aquifer. And so a cenote is a sinkhole that allows you to look down and, and see the aquifer or in some locations, especially in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, you can go down and, and actually walk around in these caverns and interact with, uh, the, with the aquifer um, uh, just as if it was on the surface. And we have a, a couple other uh, locations like that in the United States. Uh, I know of a particular location in Texas that's a cenote that's called Jacob's Well that's near Austin. Um, and so if you are ever traveling to Austin and you want to see what a cenote looks like, just um, Google up Jacob's Well. So what happens when all these sinkholes begin to kind of combine together? When the sinkholes coalesce, they become what's referred to as a karst valley. And so if we, you see we have a bunch of sinkholes, they're all scattered about over here on the right side of the figure. But as we transition over this little hill, we can see that the sinkholes are starting to, to coalesce together. That's what's referred to as a karst valley. If we go one more hill over into this far left part of the figure, you can see that the, in this particular instance, all of the sinkholes have coalesced together and has created a, a pretty nice stream bed through which a river can run through. Uh, another kind of fascinating karst feature that you can encounter is uh, cockpits. 
I have never seen these before, but I have been told that they're quite common in, in certain locations in Southeast Asia. And so this particular, I believe this is actually a LIDAR image. Uh, this particular LIDAR image, I believe, was taken either from um, Cambodia or uh, Vietnam or Laos. I'm not 100% sure, but I know somewhere in Southeast Asia. And cockpits are basically just these little mounds, and they, they kind of um, just kind of stack on top of one another, right? And you can, uh, some of them, are, are rather tall. Um, most of the time, though, they're just kind of like uh, standing on their own. I think they're pretty cool. Uh, throughout Southeast Asia is actually a really good place to see karst features. And uh, one of the, those cool karst features that I think is pretty neat are cones and towers. A cone is a slightly smaller version than a tower. And you can see a tower here in this uh, still from a, a movie that I'm about to show you here in just a second. And then you can see kind of cones off in the distance. Um, the, for any of you James Bond fans who have ever seen The Man with the Golden Gun, James Bond is pursuing the antagonist in an amphibious plane and he's flying around these really cool formations um, that was mostly shot in uh, Southeast Thailand. And so as he's flying around these locations, you, you can actually begin to see the various uh, cones and towers and lots of different other karst formations that are out there in the water. So I'll go ahead and uh, start that up and we'll just watch, you know, 20, 30 seconds of it so that you can get an idea for uh, the, the karst formations that are in The Man with the Golden Gun. That gives you a little bit of a taste for uh, cones and towers. One of the other big iconic formations that's associated with karst landscapes is going to be caves. And caves are natural underground areas that are just large enough for humans to enter. We see this very, this is a very common, you know, landform that's associated with karst landscapes. A cavern is very similar to a cave. It's uh, basically just a very large cave. Um, usually a, a cave large enough that you'll be able to stand up and walk around in. Now, as a kid, you may have learned a little bit about caves and learned about stalactites, stalagmites, columns, and, and so many other different types of formations. Uh, I just want you to focus on three. Uh, so the stalactite is a formation that grows from the ceiling down. And so we can see uh, this here. And so what happens, right, is you have the water, it, it slowly erodes the, the um, slowly erodes the rock up above, and as it erodes, um, it, it redeposits the, that uh, eroded rock into a formation that begins from the ceiling. Stalagmites, on the other hand, are very similar to the process before, except they build up from the floor, except of, uh, whereas stalactites grow down from the ceiling. So stalagmites, usually this occurs whenever uh, you have water, right? It runs over the top of the rock, drips down onto the floor, and then as it drips onto the floor, it deposits the sediment, which um, over time, you can think of this over uh, thousands or even millions of years, uh, you're going to begin to, to generate just a kind of a, a, a rock formation that comes up from the ground. Column, on the other hand, is going to be uh, basically a stalactite and a stalagmite that have formed together. And so uh, it's a floor to ceiling sort of cave formation. You can see an example uh, of it here. Um, this is from a, a cave northwest of Austin. You can see that the stalactite and the stalagmite have come together and created a column. So 
what, uh, how do you begin to even explore caves? Well, this is referred to as speleology, which is the scientific examination of a cave. Uh, you have spelunking, which is going to be the exploration of that cave. And then folks who do speleology are spelunkers. And so here's a, a very old photograph of me from sixth grade. Um, and you can, I, I just, you know, emerged from that cave. I've got my headlamp on. Uh, what I was doing right there was spelunking. I was just going in and exploring that cave. Um, there are a lot of geologists who focus on a speleology. And so if you're interested in that, uh, I'd highly recommend that you get in contact with them. Uh, I think also, I know at my alma mater back at Texas A&M, there was a spelunking club. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's one at UNC for those of you who are interested in uh, doing cave exploration. So what do we have in the docket? Well, activity two, uh, which is on earthquakes, as I mentioned on Friday, as well as last Wednesday, that's going to be due this coming Friday. I believe that is October 30th at 1155 PM. Uh, please submit it on time. Assignment three, as well as just the, the concept of mass wasting, uh, we're going to be talking about that on Wednesday. So until then, I hope you have a great rest of the week. And if you have any questions, let me know. Thanks. <laughs>